What's up, everybody? I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and welcome to The Right Mindset. Do you have a story that spans a series or a saga and want to know how to make sense of it all? Well, <laughs> boom, this is part one of a many-part series uh, where we ultimately are going to show you how to outline a book series or saga. Uh, this particular part is the main plot, building an epic saga step by step. Um, so if you are embarking on the ambitious journey of writing a series or saga and feeling overwhelmed by the scale of your vision, fear not. In this lesson outlining a book series or saga part one, the main plot, we're going to actually break down the process into manageable steps from brainstorming to connecting plot points and refining your outline. I'll guide you through the techniques that have helped me in crafting my own epic series, The Maven Wars. Uh, so join me as we lay the foundation for your grand narrative, ensuring your story captivates readers. You know, but I'm also going to show you how to outline the main plot in this video. And throughout the series, I will expand on the process by showing you real time examples, giving you some tips and ultimately preparing you for uh, the massive undertaking uh, it is. Now, keep in mind, this is going to show you uh, uh, my goal is to say, hey, listen, if you could create like a generalized full narrative and you're like, I would really like to spend more time on certain areas of the story, but I, I'm constrained by word count. This method will also ultimately over the course of the videos show you how to take a single concept and break it up into a series or a saga. The other thing is, if you have a series or a saga, uh, and you already have the book ideas, how do you keep them working and how do you map them out? And this this series will go over that. However, in this video, I will first go over brainstorming and then mapping out a single form uh, narrative. Okay, so why is it important? Outlining a book series of saga is, is a difficult and challenging thing, and it's crucial for maintaining narrative coherence and consistency across multiple volumes. That does not mean you can't change things, you can't be a little bit malleable, you can't uh, assimilate ideas into the story. It just means if you could start off with a very broad and general concept over the course of X amount of books, um, it helps with maintaining the narrative coherence and the consistency. Uh, so looking at characters' growths, their plot, their plot, uh, their arcs to developing uh, character development, uh, the story arcs, subplots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, for example, my original series started off as three books. Okay. Um, I, uh, I sort of had like the protagonist point of view, then the antagonist point of view of the same time. So they were basically companion books and then i had the sequel basically what happened after the events of those two perspectives as i was mapping out the story i realized that there was more to tell in that first book so i broke it down for me i actually started by breaking it down into two books and the, I was like, let me go up to the midpoint conflict and then do a second book, that, right? And then just keep a... And then I realized, wait a minute, there's still more I can tell in this book because I'm rushing through stuff. Eventually, I got down to the point where the first book turned into five books. So that became a series. And then the second book is about five books as well. Uh, so that became a second series. And then I took the third book originally, designed to be a third book, and broke that up into five books. So now I have a 15 book saga that's broken up into three series, but they have a consistent narrative and it's coherent. Things are connecting. <coughs> and it's because as I was breaking up the story and implementing and doing all these things, I was able to uh, cross move ideas and uh, things stick together, okay? So let's do this. Uh, some of the objectives for this uh, lesson will be to understand the importance of structure, where we'll learn how to brainstorm effectively, uh, mastering techniques of connecting plot points, and of course, equipping ourselves with strategies to reviewing and refining our outline. 
Okay, so the main purpose to this uh, <clears throat> video is the main plot. If you've been following my channel for a while, you know that I am currently working on the epic fantasy saga, The Maven Wars. This idea began as a three novel series, as I explained, okay? The, and ultimately, the first novel was, as I said, the main protagonist, and then it was the antagonist, and then obviously the aftermath. Uh, as I quickly realized that it was too much, and the first book was well over 800,000 potential words. That was a guesstimate in my uh, estimation because, you know, I was working out the stuff and I was like, there's a lot going on. <laughs> the other thing is if you work within the 27 plot point outline or the 27 chapter outline, depending on what you want to call it, um, you can see if you're overdoing it. Like if a plot point has like more than five chapters in it, you might be going pretty heavy. Not that you can't have more than five chapters, but if it's like 10 chapters and then one chapter and then like two chapters and then like 10 chapters and then 12 chapters and one chapter, like each plot point has like the you might uh, be placing things in the wrong area and or not allowing the story to breathe a little bit. Um, so that's what's really nice about the 27 plot point outline is it allows you to kind of see and organize the story as is, which I do in live videos. Um so by acknowledging this as I was working out, I knew that I had to break it up. And that's how I ultimately became a saga. So it became three series in a saga. And this lesson is going to show you the techniques I use to organize a large narrative into smaller bite-sized experiences for the audience. I should say this playlist, this, uh, uh, this playlist, on how to outline a series of saga will show you how to organize larger narrative into smaller bite time. Today is just going to be focused on brainstorming and mapping out a main narrative. Now, my goal is not to get the most out of one series, but what would best serve the narrative and the experience of that narrative. So this is the first video on the playlist that will go over the following outlining the overall larger narrative as a simple idea. Other videos that will be in this playlist will focus on subplots, character arcs, expanding the saga, mapping out chapters, etc. Okay, but today is going to focus mostly on the main plot. I'm going to go over three tips that can help you in this process, and then we're going to go into uh, uh we're going to walk through. We're going to actually we're going to walk through the process. We're going to walk through it. Okay, so. The first tip is brainstorming. Brainstorming is so important. Brainstorming, this is the get it all out of your head and don't worry what works and what doesn't work part of the process. Embracing the brainstorming session will help you get all the ideas, all the gunk and all the greatness out onto the page before really digging down. Now, this isn't necessarily saying write like pants it out however you can. This is more like bullet pointing and just coming up with uh, character ideas, character concepts that you want to see, character arcs you want to see, maybe even scenes, you know, maybe working out some dialogue, finding character voices, whatever. It's it's just you playing around, okay? And that's the thing, like embracing the brainstorming sessions will help you get all the ideas out onto the page and then you'll be able to really dig down deep into making something out of it. You could see what's working, maybe something else sparks an idea, and if it's as small as a wonder, or as big as a massive city, like the idea is just filled with detail, that's great. You know, and things to consider while brainstorming is narrative ideas. You want what kind of narratives are you interested in writing about? Think about the conflicts, the victories, the character development that move you passionately. I personally might write small things like they struggle with finding the strength to talk to the person they want to be. Uh, with or they know that their parent their their parent is a soldier and one day wants to achieve the same level of success as that. So again, um, if I was to uh, give that to you on the screen, boop 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 boop, boom. Okay, so it could be as something as small as. Right. This is just a narrative idea. They struggle with finding the strength to talk to the person they want to be with 
or they know that their parent is a soldier and one day wants to achieve the same level of success. So those are two ideas. I'm not committed to either one of them. I just brainstorm. So, you know, that's my first thought. And now I might break that down. I might go, you know what? Uh, either or. They know that their parent or or the parent, they know that that one of their parents is a soldier and one day. Okay. All right. Anyway. Boop. Okay. The other thing is think about develop core characters, you know, create generalized avatars uh, for key characters. I personally don't like to do a like one of those long bullet point lists where it's like their favorite color is purple or, you know, they like long walks on short beaches. I like to generalize my approach. And uh, over time, it'll come to life. At, those characters will come to life as I map out my main plot and my subplots. I like to discover who the characters are first through what I want to see them go through. And then while I'm doing my zero draft or I'm, or I'm outlining, usually when I'm doing the zero draft, I'll discover their stronger voice. But that's because I'm challenging them in the zero draft as I'm writing, you know, within the plot points that I'm developing. And I can see the pushback and how they react to it. And then I allow their emotional truths to maintain behavior and grow as they change their positions. Um, but this doesn't mean you can't you like personally can't include backgrounds, motivations, like whatever works for you. This is the this is what you want to work on, though. You want to develop core character ideas. Uh, everyone is different. So, you know, consider what works best for you. If you like long lists, if you like doing a questionnaire, if you like to just sort of like, who are these characters in a sentence, do it. In fact, there's a couple of characters, if not a lot of characters in my novels that started as concepts of behavior and emotional interest, I guess. And then I dressed them up, meaning I didn't start, I didn't go, this is a woman or a man. This is a Hamarian or a Valus or a, or a troll or a, you know an Akid. I just I was like, who is this person inside? What are their goals? What do they care about? What's important? And then I but I also thought about the things I wanted to challenge. Like I wanted to see characters uh, pushed against their core elements. So if I developed a character that had a very interesting core element, um, as an example, let's say they uh, they know that one of their parents is a soldier and one day wants to achieve the same level of success as them, maybe I would create a counter character to that. You know, and uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the goal is that that character is going to push against that idea or... Maybe I'll create another character that is in that world and friends with that person. And it doesn't matter if they're a guy or a girl yet. It doesn't matter if they're tall or short yet. It doesn't matter what species they are. Because I do species in my world. I don't do races. Species like a Hamarian is di way physically different than a Valus. As a Valus is physically different than a troll. As a troll is physically different than an Akid. Like they are different species. They are. It's not like us humans where... Uh, we just have darker skin or lighter skin, but we are all the same species. We are all humans, humanoids, the uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, but when I'm writing a fantasy world, so, you know, elves are not the same species as, well, I don't have humans in my world. But anyway, so those are things to think about is like, who are they at the core? And then once you figure that out, now you could dress them up. Of course, it's your story, so you can start with, I want a guy and a girl, or I want two girls, or I want two guys, All right? You also want to consider your themes, not that you have to in the beginning. You can develop your themes, you could find your themes, but think about things that you're passionate about. Think about your morals, uh, messages that you like to put into stories. Um, the idea, though, is you do not want to take messages that are morals or uh, your standpoints and breathe them into your story in the I am right, right? But you wanna create conversations about it through the narrative and less with straightforward dialogue. For example, as many of you know, I love seeing healthy relationships, communication, and strong friendships 
in my stories. This doesn't mean they are all that way or even that they start out that way. It means that I want to represent that somewhere, somehow, these things exist. I also love teamwork. Therefore, I try to show strength through unity. Um, but I never mention or present an argument without a counter argument, either through exploration, discovery, or debate. Um, a big theme for one of the characters in the first novel uh, is the idea of death, to kill. Uh, they are a warrior. Uh, they are learning to fight. And the reality is one day a warrior has to protect their people. And you might have to kill somebody. And what does that mean for you? And that this character is surrounded by veterans, people who have been in wars. And so now we get to have that nice philosophical debate. I'm not saying killing is wrong and I'm not saying killing isn't wrong, but I'm allowing the philosophical debate to be pushed through the character's growth and their involvement in the, in the fighting or in the war or the training. And that's a really nice way to present the theme is when you have two or three or even four positions kind of looking at the same question because then it doesn't become preachy. So remember that brainstorming is a, you know, <clears throat> brainstorming these ideas, you have the free reign to do whatever you want. And when you come up with your themes or if you come up with your character cores or whatever it is you, you work out, remember that it's a, it's a judge free zone. Like, they're all ideas and they could all change. <laughs> like they're not, it doesn't matter how outlandish it is. It doesn't matter if it's undeveloped. It doesn't matter if it's perfect. It's like, just put it down. This is the fun part. This is the, you can do whatever you want part, you know, but anyway, all right. Number two, connecting the dots. This is the, uh, this is a basic process with a simple method, though it can be challenging in the beginning. See, you want to look at the main plot and where it begins, ends, and or maybe you have only a middle realized. Maybe you only came up with the middle. You're like, I don't really know where it's going. I just, I have this really great midpoint conflict. So you could take one or all of these moments and uh, kind of start mapping them together, trying to brainstorm these plot points. And this is where you'll see that each plot point in the 27 plot point outline will guide you in making sense of those dots. If you've watched my live videos on Saturdays, uh, you'll see that I have done this in real time and where I might write ideas and go, wait a minute, this might not actually be that plot point. And then I move it and you could adjust things as needed. A quick example. Okay. So, uh, the protagonist wants to become a Navy SEAL to follow in the footsteps of one of their parents, right? We were just kind of playing with that idea. What would be the most interesting narrative for you to tell or for you to explore? See, now me, I, I already kind of worked this out just so I can get through it and then get, get to the walkthrough for you. I might like to see the narrative begin with them having to choose between college or the Navy. That becomes the ordinary world, Okay. From there, the conflict is, uh, do they or do they not go to college and why don't they go to college? Okay. So the dots connect themselves as long as with each dot, you look at the conflict of the choice, the consequence of that choice and where it could go as results of those choices. In that example, the person ends up going into the Navy and now they are challenged even though their parents don't want them to do it because they know the horror of it. Or maybe they do, and they are excited to see them join the family business of it all. It could go either way. But in that situation, the ordinary world is they're coming at the end of their uh, high school, their, their, their 12th grade, and they're either going to go to college or they're going to go into the Navy. You could have the challenge of the parents being on board or not on board. Uh, however, if the parents aren't on board, now you have two dilemmas. You have the, the child thinking, which one do I go in? Which would be the, the consequences or the best? What's the pros and cons? And the parent going, go to the college, pushing towards the cut. Don't do, don't do the Navy. But then you might have the parents going, yeah, you should go into the Navy, right? If you have that way, now there's pressure to join the Navy. And maybe there's something about college that they really want to do. But maybe they, you know, everyone in the family has been in, you know, the service. The, uh, the inciting incident 
uh, would ultimately be that something, uh, maybe they hear a story and they're like, you know what? The Navy is the place for me, whatever, you know, anyway. All right. And the third tip is dot your eyes and cross your heart. I mean, tease. Uh, this is the fun part, or is it? No. <laughs> Take the time to read over the plot points within your outline, checking to see if the main plot makes narrative sense and follows a logic uh, progression. At this point, you can move things around, add stuff, delete, etc., etc. So this is when you start laying down things into the plot point, um, the 27 plot point outline, and you start saying what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. Am I missing a beat? Did I go too fast? Did I did I add too many things? I added 27 plot points, but did I get to a certain point too quick? Is there something else I should explore? How do I move things around? All right. So that's uh, pretty easy. Okay. So before we go to the walkthrough, remember, if you haven't done so already and you like what you've been watching on the channel, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. So let's go into brainstorming. Brainstorming. All right, what do we got here? What is this, 12? All right. Boop, 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 boop. All right, so we have this. So brainstorming is uh, as simple as just getting it out of your head, right? Do, 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 do. You want to just brainstorm, okay? Let the ideas flow out of your mind. All right, so um, we just kind of made up ideas. Uh, so uh, the kid, by the way, we haven't said if they're a boy or a girl because it's not important right now. Um, <clears throat> the kid uh, is about to graduate uh, high school, and they don't know if they want to join uh, the Navy or go to college. Now... I kind of like uh, the pressure of uh, their parents want them to join the Navy and follow in the footsteps of their father, uh, grandfather, <coughs> and great uh, grand grandfather and great grandmother right um oh we could also do this the father uh uncle aunt whatever grandfather and great great grandfather um all right uh the other thing is uh but they uh they have an interest in being part of something uh more intimate to their uh, creative heart, which is to become a writer. Huh. All right. Anyway, so now I'm just working out the main concept, the main through, like this is the main plot. I haven't mapped it out, obviously, but it's just the main plot, right? And then you can just kind of go into it from there. You could start saying, uh, like we said, you know, uh, they um end up meeting someone who is already in uh the navy and they really bond uh however their best friend is a writer in college because they graduated a year earlier uh, they are a year older. Okay. <clears throat> so now you're creating dynamics. You're creating uh, potential for challenges and et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is the whole point, right? Uh, but I'm not beholden to these ideas. I'm just saying to myself, let me just let the ideas come out. And if you notice, I'm creating characters because I now I need a person who is in the Navy. I need somebody who's in college already. I need someone who is the best friend, right? But again, I did not uh, categorize them as something. I didn't say to myself, uh, what is their uh, nationality? What is their culture? What is Because 
I like to start with the emotional core, the truth, the motives, um, you know, the ideas of action or inaction. And then as I start, as I start laying the story out, I'll allow that to kind of, uh, be the playground where I'm like, Oh, you know, okay. I could add this or I could add that, you know, what's their, what's their style of dress? You know, what is their culture? You know? Um, cause there are stories where I, uh, I really journey into different, uh, religions and faiths and I journey into the concept of, uh, people who are against faith, but also people who are for faith, uh, you know, so, but I don't start there. However, I might start with somebody, um, who doesn't connect to faith, right? And then I might, st- now I'm like, I need a counterpoint to that. So I need someone who is deeply faithful or is starting their journey into faith, but I'm still not saying what the faith is or who, who they are or what nationality are or what culture they have. It's just, again, the core concept. It's just the foundational element. And that's what brainstorming should be for you, uh, is allow yourself to be more generalized. However, you can be specific. I could literally be like, the uncle uh, lost their leg uh, and um, saw a majority of their friends uh, ended in uh, Vietnam, right? So now, oh, and did uh, their friends did not make it home uh, after being deployed to Vietnam. Now, this creates some limitations, right? Because I became a little bit more specific. However, I'm a writer, so I could literally do whatever I want. I could be like, you know, whatever. I could they could be aliens. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, in fact, it, it could be elves. They could be orcs. They could be <laughs> like, I can make a fantasy. Like it doesn't, writers could do whatever they want. And that's what I mean. Like you could just throw out the most outlandish things. They, they could be, you know what? It is Vietnam, but it's all ants. Uh, and they speak and they're three feet high. They're free. They're all three feet tall. Right. But the Vietnamese are maybe uh, beetles. Like you could do whatever you want. It's writing. But anyway, so the uncle lost their leg and saw a majority of the friends. Uh, they saw uh, a majority of their friends did not make it home after being. I didn't want to use the, the other word. Because, but anyway, um, uh, this leads to them denouncing their faith. Now, here's the thing that's a little bit more uh, leads to them denouncing denouncing their faith right so that's a little bit more broader because i'm not saying what faith they are but they are denouncing it right but we know that they're an uncle so they're a dude uh we know that they lost their leg so they're going to be handy capable um and uh they saw uh their friends not make it home so we know that there's a potential for trauma ptsd um and then uh we know that they were in vietnam so depending on what year this if it's present day we know this character the uncle has to be at least in their 70s right at least maybe maybe late 60s uh definitely early 70s right um so that that creates certain things uh we know that if i am setting it in a realistic world that is earth uh this was the first non-segregated war where they integrated uh poc uh people and uh and the uh less poc people the pal the palsters um right so we know that exists but we also know uh this is you know now we can do i want to explore certain topics right and that's the thing the more specific you get the more your story be becomes beholden to potential concepts but again, it is your story. You don't have to focus on those things, but those become elements that you can explore. Um, however, I could be like deployed to ground, grounding, grounding. All right. What's grounding, Thomas? It's a made up place. So now are we on Earth or are we not on Earth? I could make it an Earth like place, but grounding 
means that I have more leeway and I could start brainstorming what is grounding. I can make grounding like Vietnam, but I could also make it like the Arctic and maybe humans. This is uh, hundreds of thousands of years later after nuclear war. And we've uh, adapted to both uh, to, to the to the next ice age. Whatever. I could do whatever I want. It's a story. Right. Um, so that's the idea of brainstorming is like if you allow it to be more about core values and less about specifics, that's why I might say the uncle, um, a family member lost their leg and so a majority of the friends did not make it home after deploying to a war. Okay. The more, so the less specific you are, the more you can kind of play with ideas in the brainstorming world. Uh, the more specific you get, uh, you start creating like, all right, I have a limitation. Like, for example, if I said he was Catholic, there are certain things that Catholics do, just as if I said he was Jewish, if I said he was Muslim, if I said he was ever. Now, if I said he was a devout blank, 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 or he's sort of uh, his family is a blank, 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 but he isn't so much that create. Now I'm now I'm creating story, right? But it's in that world. Like a, a devout Catholic is different than a devout Jewish person. It just, it's because of the culture and the faith. Um, so those speci specific specificities, uh, the specific elements of those ideas would in turn start kind of dictating where I take the story or how I lead them because characters make choices based on uh, who they are as individuals and their culture and their upbringing and, or, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway. All right. So that's, that's an idea of, of brainstorming. Um, in the live videos on Saturdays, there are days where I just show brainstorming and show how to work through that. But I'd like to get to plotting out the main plot line. Now I already did this uh, just so I can sort of read through it and show you some ideas. All right. Um, this is going to be one long uh, 27 plot point uh, narrative. Boop. And you're saying, hey, Tom, uh, aren't we supposed to be working on a series of saga? So I'm going to show you the method at which I created my series slash saga. And that was I came up with a plot point uh, a main story first. So through this, uh, these uh, videos, you're going to see how to take a established story and maybe expand on it and go deeper and really dig into the story. And we're going to do so with a noir story idea. So th this is a this is a prologue. Now, right off the bat, the first thing I would do, by the way, uh, I probably get rid of the prologue and epilogue. I would just stick with the main story, but I have a prologue and epilogue in here because I just wanted you to see like what a full narrative might look like. Okay. So for the main narrative, we start off with, uh, basically developing the tone. You know, that that's what, that's what the prologue does. The tone style of writing might be in there. Uh, you're introducing characters, themes, things like that. So it, that's why I just sort of just said, you know, in a dimly lit room, private detective Jack is uh, handed an envelope filled with cash and a, photo a photograph of a woman, Elizabeth, by a shadowy figure who insists she's in danger but refuses to reveal more. The air is thick with tension and spoken threats, setting the stage for a perilous investigation. Now, as I was working on this, like I finished it and I was like, I'll just wait till I'm on video, but I might actually make that be a flash forward that's somewhere like in the middle of the story. And then we, the story then works up to that moment. And we're like, Oh, that's the, uh, the epilogue. Anyway, as you can see, I have act one. This is the setup. I usually title my acts. Uh, I'm not, I didn't title this one yet because we're not in that phase yet. We're going to wait until we get there. Uh, and how many chapters we aren't there yet, but I, this is also a template I use when I'm just sort of like, quickly mapping out ideas anyway so the ordinary world i basically say that uh you know if you want you could pause and read it but uh ultimately what i'm doing is i'm just setting up the world i'm setting up who jack is what his uh, daily routine is 
Uh, I'm introducing the inciting incident where he basically gets a case and then uh, we delve into that case and we undercover some ideas. Then I explore the problems that disrupt the protagonist. And this is where I basically mapped out that he's investigating some ideas. All right. Uh, you know, he gets uh, some more, uh, despite warnings to drop the case. All right. So now we're opening up some conflicts and challenges. Right. And this is where he's like, oh, I'm going to take action because I want to, I want to keep going. Uh, and then as a consequence of those actions, which is ultimately that, you know, the underworld is like, yo, Jack, not today, buddy. And then of course the life changes. Uh, and Jack, if you're not following, this is where I am. Uh, Jack and Elizabeth, the, the lady, uh, they grow a little closer and uh, they realize there's a businessman named Michael and he's uh, very dangerous connections. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, the plot twist, or this is actually a pinch. The pinch is that she confesses that she possesses a secret that could incriminate Michael putting her life in jeopardy. In doing so, he ultimately is like, well, we're going to take this guy down, which brings us into act two. Again, this is the conflict, but I didn't title it and I didn't uh, give it any chapters. The first uh, the ascending rise to the midpoint conflict is ultimately like uh, he's leading into the heart of corruption. They're following some things. They're navigating stuff uh, that, you know, but then we give a little fun and games. We get to learn a little bit about who Jack is and, uh, you know, he employs his detective skills. We see him using his skills and actually putting clues together. He's engaging in a cat and mouse game with foes who always seem one step ahead of him. This in my head, if I was making this a chapter, this would actually be the uh, he's he's in his office and he's and he's mapping out everything. Uh, you know, he's like, oh, where do I put this? And and he's like, you know, you see all the strings and everything and pictures and, and he's like, you know, notes. And he's like, I think I figured it out. Uh, and then he reflects on the past. Obviously, he recognizes the parallels between this case and the one that had personal consequences fueling his determination. So now we're kind of uh thinking about stuff he's done in his past now we get to the midpoint conflict which is uh section five okay uh basically everything leads to him um being betrayed you know so you know he has some crucial evidence uh and he's like what's going on there's some conspiracy and a, and a verdict and then we may you know we push towards him and uh jack is like oh i just got betrayed this is horrible and then he's wounded in the betrayal. So Jack realizes that Elizabeth may not be who she claims. Okay. Well, she may not be who she claims, which takes us to the riding, finding a solution. So as we ascend from, uh, uh, descend from the conflict, his job is to find a solution, figure out how to make right the midpoint conflict, uh, you know, the, the, the conflict from the midpoint, uh, and figure out what's going on. So uh reeling from the betrayal of the complexity of the case jack retreats into the shadows planning his next move he basically has to get together he's like oh that was a lot that was crazy i'm hurt i gotta heal right uh once he's healed he's like i gotta be a little i gotta take action i gotta do something so he's like you know let's do some coat let's conduct a series of convert covert operations to gather more evidence and he risks his life you know and despite that setback uh when he discovers uh, conspiracies and stuff like that, uh, his doubt about Elizabeth and the personal toll the case has taken, Jack still commits to seeing justice. He's like, is this worth it? And he's like, yes, it is. Which brings us to Act 3 of the resolution. Section 7 is, um, this is the quiet before the final showdown. Jack assembles the last pieces of the puzzle, preparing to expose the conspiracy. He's putting all his, all his, all, all his uh, ducks in a row. Quack, quack. Uh, then we get another plot twist and we, we discover that Elizabeth was coerced into her role. Now, this is also a pinch. The reason it's not a plot twist is because, um, a, a plot twist wouldn't put pressure on you through the pinch. Like it shouldn't put you in a bind. Like this is causing him to make a decision because everything he thought was one thing. Uh, he's like, oh, wait. I had I had feelings for Elizabeth, like I cared about her safety, but I thought 
she was uh which was a bad person uh but not only is she a good person but she she's doing this under the stress if it was a twist it would be like elizabeth was always the bad person like what he had thought turns out to be true but it's but it's actually in this moment it'd be worse than true she is not only a bad person but she would be the person running everything but since it's not that it's more of a pinch because his initial feelings for her were right and the fact that she's being coerced into the role and her family's being threatened it pinches him it it's a little bit more push on him and because of that uh <clears throat> It leads to Elizabeth's life hanging in the balance. Jack faces that, uh, what seems like an insurmountable standoff. All right, so now the protagonist has to go to uh, find a power, and this is where, this is all this, okay. Um, so basically Jack is like, I have to create a plan. I will, it'll, it'll have to turn the tables on Michael, but I, I think I could do it. So in a daring move, Jack manages the free Elizabeth and use it. So he does take he does take action on the plan he created, and uh, you know he uses the evidence to trap the Michael. But ultimately, we converge everything. So any any loose loose ends we would have here. The final confrontation unfolds at a rain soaked pier where all the story threads come together in a tense and dramatic climax. However. Now we get into the final battle, which is the protagonist fights and wins. This is where in the climactic battle of wits and wills, Jack outmaneuvers Michael, leading to the villain's downfall, exposed by his own criminal uh, machinations. All right. Um, then uh, the authorities arrive and they take Michael and his cronies into custody. Jack and Elizabeth share a moment of victory, tempt tempered by the scars of their ordeal. And then we, we resolve it and the case closes. Jack reflects on the journey, acknowledges the cost of the thing. Now, again, I probably would take away this epilogue when we go into the next, uh, when we go deeper into the stats, but this is ultimately, you know, he's reflecting on everything and he's like, ah, okay. All right. So again, if you want, you can go back and kind of, you know, read those and take those in. But the reason I, I ran through that is because the most important element is that we set up a full narrative. This is a complete narrative. This could be one novel, but the goal of this is to show you how to take one isolated idea and expand it into a series and or a saga. Um, a spoiler alert, we will show you how to take one of the other characters and create an expanded series on that idea where there's uh, some of the subplots I've already worked on for video two. You'll see those characters and say, oh, we can now go to that area and create another series. And ultimately that series will be seeding something bigger. And then you could have another series. And now those three series are all together and it creates a saga, a noir saga. And it connects everything from the first book all the way to the last book. And that's what we're going to basically show you. Now, before we go, I want to talk about. Uh, um, <clears throat> Let me delete that. I want to talk about practicing this concept. You know, to reinforce these concepts, practice by outlining a short story or a segment of your larger work. Begin with brainstorming. Uh, freely jotting down any ideas. But next, you want to choose a few key plot points and explore how they connect, considering the consequences and emotional impacts. And then finally, review your outline and ensure it makes sense. Okay? These are things I will do on live videos. I will map out stuff, and then I'll explore it and talk about why I made those choices and, and how I came up with it. And they're all on the top of my head. There's nothing, whatever. <clears throat> Final thought. As we wrap up today's exploration into the art of outlining a book, series, or saga, it's important to reflect on the journey we've embarked on. So crafting a series is much like embarking on an epic voyage across unknown seas. Daunting, yes, but filled with the promise of discovery and the thrill of creation. Your outline is more than just a map. It's a living, breathing compass that guides your narrative through the storms of doubt and the mists 
of uncertainty. Ensuring every character, every plot twist, and every moment of triumph is woven into the tapestry of your saga with purpose and passion. Now remember, the greatest epics of our time began as a mere whispers of ideas, nurtured by the persistent spirit of their creators. You are no different, my friends. With each step you take in this outlining process, you're not just plotting a story, you're charting the course of your legacy as a storyteller. So let the characters inspire you and the complexity drive you to new heights of creativity. Your series has the potential, this is true, to resonate deeply with the hearts of your readers, to offer them solace, adventure, and reflection in ways you might not yet imagine. So believe in yourself. As you continue on this journey, carry with you the knowledge that every great saga was once a daunting endeavor made manageable by the brave decision to start, to plan, and to believe in the unfolding story. So let this lesson be more of a beacon as you navigate the vast waters of your imagination. Be bold, be patient, and above all, be kind to yourself as your world takes shape on the page. The stories you are destined to tell are a gift to the world waiting to be unwrapped one chapter at a time. Work to fail so you can learn. And my dear storyteller, as we part ways today, <laughs> take with you not just the tools and techniques we've shared, but also the unshakable belief in the power of your own creativity. The path ahead may be long and winding, but it is yours to shape, and it is lined with the possibility of wonder and awe. Go forth with courage, with passion, and with the unwavering conviction that your stories will be a beacon for those who seek the magic only you can provide. <laughs> Next video in the series, we'll focus on subplots and character arc. So it'll be outlining a book series of saga, part two, subplots and character arcs. Question, what do you like about outlining? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, if you haven't done already, uh, so already, and you love what you watch, and you're like, this guy is a whack job, but I enjoy listening to his rhetoric, <laughs> please subscribe and hit that bell icon so you don't miss out. A quick reminder, I do live videos on Saturday. I may or may not have mentioned it once or twice in this video. And uh, feel free to join in because I love taking uh, questions while doing my videos, um, you know. We're just a whole bunch of writers and readers getting together and having fun. As always, you got to remember to keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Love you. Bye.